It is my pleasure to introduce to you Paul Soriano. There are three things that a man will tell you in the course of a relationship. <clears throat> and they are, I want you, I need you, and I love you. And when he says, I love you, you know it's over. Just saying. I met Jimbo in 1980. It was summertime. Mount St. Helens had just blown its top. And I was living in a one-room apartment on Clay Street. All I had was a mattress and an overstuffed chair that I pulled up from the street. I had, um, my boyfriend at the time had uh, decided to come visit me. He lived out in, uh, out in Scapoose, and I didn't get to see him very often. But he dragged this guy along with him, Jimbo, and uh, came up and got to know each other a little bit. Um, Jimbo sat in the chair while my boyfriend and I kind of got reacquainted horizontally. I think I was 19, Jimbo was 15, so that age you do a lot of that horizontally kind of thing. Um, I remember just looking over at him every so often and I, I was fascinated. He looked like Pan, he looked like mischief. I could almost see his horns. Um, he just sat there smiling and I just could not keep my eyes off of him. So, um, we get done and on the way out he hands me his number. And I just realized the other night while I was folding laundry that I had never actually seen him write his number down or take out a piece of paper. So I'm kind of wondering about that. We made a date and so we decided to get together for dinner. I uh, showed up at his house on Sandy. He was living with a sugar daddy, kind of keeping house in a big house off of Sandy. It was one of those places that had a nice big porch and um, great big tree and shade in front of it. I kind of rolled up. Uh, someone had given me a ride, some poor girl on the way to wherever. And um, he, was he was sitting in a rocking chair on the porch with his khakis rolled up, little toe head, blonde, and um, 15 years old, and his uh, Oxford shirt kind of buttoned down halfway, no shoes, rocking, reading a letter with his glasses kind of crooked on his face. He looked all Cape Cod. And I show up, of course. I had a really good bottle of wine with me, and um, looking all suave in New York. I'm, I'm a New Yorker. And, had to look, had to look my part for the for the evening, and we got to know each other. Said hi, and um, we walked in the door, and our clothes were off. <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of a pattern. I'm not gonna bore you with the details of that. Uh, after after, well, we had uh, peppers and sausage, and we drank that bottle of wine. And we sat up talking late into the night. Um, it was like it was like getting to know or catching up with an old friend. It wasn't like getting to know someone at all. Uh, it seemed like we had known each other for a long, long time. And we just kept talking and we went out to the porch and we sat there while ashes started to fall. And they were kind of like, it was almost like snow in the middle of July, kind of peeking through the uh, lamplight in front of the house. It was really kind of magical. It's funny the things that you um, fall in love with. It's the little things. He used to group things in threes. I don't know, just turn me on. Um, he, um, the way he would like push his glasses up when he was doing the books uh, he was living as a houseboy, kind of uh, keeping the household, and really was for a fifteen-year-old. He was pretty. He was pretty uh, savvy and uh, pretty much an adult. Um, 
it really is funny the way you fall in love with little things. Like he was training his finches. He had four finches. He was training them to attack people. He'd let them out of the cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And then one day, mysteriously, one died. And then there were three. And I have always wondered about that. <laughs> when you are young, your body has a way of radiating heat. And um, we would sit in the winter nights on his window sill on the second floor, totally naked with the windows open. And our bodies would radiate such heat that it would be a mist and it would float across the lawn in the winter. And to this day, I still sleep with the, winter, with the windows open. We had, um, it was magic, it was magic. And I thought at that time that if I could die right now, I would be as happy as I would ever be. It must have been strange to other people, I think. You know, we love the theater, we love good wine, we love good food, we both lived well for our age. We were both from the East Coast. Uh, so our, we had a lot in common that way in, in being adults long before we were ever adults, I think. It must have been strange for people in Portland because we were teenagers and we acted like 40 years old, 40 year olds. And we, we would go to the theater and try to, get, um, try to get people to buy us wine online at intermission. <laughs> it's like, We'd have dinner at the Heathman, and there would always be a waiter positioned between us and the door, as though we were going to bolt, and we just laughed at that. Um, and it went on like this for a long time, for a little over a year. And then when you're a teenager, that's a long time. It's just amazing. Uh, but things change. Everything changes, and this did too. He said something, and I said something, and... Um, yeah, I walked out. I just, and you know, you'd think that every relationship is going to be the same. This is my first love, the first time I ever experienced anything like that. And I thought, oh, you know, the next one, I'll know better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I walked out. That was the, I want you. I need you. I had decided I'd grow up. I went to school. I moved to Seattle. I started a life. Um, one of those things, I, I, I had a boyfriend, and one of those things um, that you do when you're gay is you get tested for HIV. So I had this near-life experience. It's about five years later. I'm in Seattle. I had a near-life experience. I found out that I was positive. And I was like, oh, shit. And this is the 80s when... Um, at that time, it was a death sentence for most people. At least you'd think so. For me, I was like, oh, you know, they don't know anything. That's good, actually, because they're so, maybe there's hope. But uh, it made me think a lot about the things I might regret. And one of the things that I had always regretted was that I had left Jimbo, that we had somehow lost touch with each other. But I thought about him all the time. Uh, it was shortly after that I got a Christmas card in July. And, yeah, I know. And what it said was, fuck you, and a number. So I, uh, it took me a couple of months to call, but I did. And his boyfriend at the time uh, was like, oh, yeah, he's been waiting for your call. Wow, uh, that's OK. Um, he also had a near-life experience. He had been in a car accident. He nearly died. He was in the hospital for about six months. And uh, he, I guess we kind of came to the same place, maybe in different places, but at the same time. And he wanted to kind of reconnect. And we did. We got together. And the first thing we noticed when I walked into the room was that we both had our heads shaved. I was like, oh, hey. What's that about? Hmm. And that would be the same for a long, long time. Um, the second thing we did, of course, was take our clothes off because <laughs> it was um, 20 years of 
just about that. We were as close as any two people could ever be. We hardly ever were distant in any way, either in space or in our hearts. We had boyfriends, we had lives that we lived outside of that, but um, we managed to be intimate in ways that uh, I don't think most people ever experience. And it got to be the point that we were so close, people sometimes thought we were brothers. It's funny. Um, he moved to Seattle for a while and we were hanging out and we'd go to a club or go to a bathhouse and he'd tell people we were brothers and we'd be like hanging out and start making out. And I gotta tell you, <laughs> incest, it's still not really cool. It's just, it totally freaks, totally freaks people out. It's, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the thing that you'd think it'd be. Um, at one point, we finally decided that we got to quit sleeping together. And he had met this young man here in Portland, and he was really sweet on him. And I thought, you yeah, know, okay. For me, the most important thing was this great friendship that I had, this connection, this ability to be with someone who got me totally. And, um, you know, we, we had a great time. Uh, it was a little disturbing, I think, to our partners because we would start a conversation and it'd be three o'clock in the morning all of a sudden and everyone else had gone to bed and they'd be really bored or pissed off with us. So kind of had to keep it cool for a while. Uh, and it went on like this for a long, long time. And I am, I am so blessed for that. I had just come back from New York after 9-11 and um, I was probably a little crazy. I didn't know it at the time. I bought a Beamer. I got a 20-year-old boyfriend. I was kind of, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my God, I gotta live. No, no, no. Um, it was about Christmas time, and he had uh, come down, come up to Seattle with his boyfriend, and we had dinner at the Pink Door. It's this little restaurant in the market, and there are cobblestone streets, and really very pretty. And, after dinner, we're walking out and the snow is falling and he turned around to me and said, I love you. Now, man, there's all these alarms going off and um, I didn't know really what to say. But I looked at him uh, square in the face and I said, I know, I've always known that. Hoping that it would just kind of go away. It was really nice. He, you know, we planned a trip to Mexico because I was so crazy. Um, just, time, just time to get away and um, time to relax and, and try to kind of shake off that whole 9-11 thing. Um, we arrived in Mexico and it was a year that there was this really nasty hurricane. So we had rented a villa. It was up on the side of a hill, kind of in a a canyon of sorts, and we were looking at the ocean. Uh, he had most of his family there, and people were all around us most of the time. But they were smart enough to go to the back of the house, especially when they heard a hurricane was coming. So he wakes me up and says, no, no, you got to see this hurricane. He had pulled two chairs up to the window and told me to sit down. I'm like, oh, OK, I have no idea what's going on. I'm just, all I know is that there's Skies are getting dark and everything, and everyone's in the back room. Um, I took a seat, and uh, in the background, all I hear is the blender, margaritas. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I should have known something was up. So we sat there, and we drank margaritas, and the sky got dark, and it was just, the winds were blowing, and everything was almost like the world was going to end. And he looked at me right to my face, and he said, I've got to make this work. You know, he's with his boyfriend and he's got a life going on. And I've got to make this work. And I went, uh, uh, okay. Um, I had uh, decided somewhere in that craziness that I was going to move to Portland, and I did, that we were going to be a family and uh, we'd all be together again. 
you always think, you know, you have those friends when you're growing up and you're in high school and when you're young that you always think that you're going to know them forever, that nothing will change. But it does. You get older, you grow up, you have your own families. I never thought that would happen to me, but it did. And uh, I moved here. We had one night where we actually sat down and the world went away. His boyfriend, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, is in the other room sleeping already. And we're outside in the living room, just really good bottle of wine, because they keep getting better as we go along. <laughs> uh, you know, just so engrossed in each other. And I just had this feeling that that was it. And it was. Everything has an ending, uh, especially if it has a beginning. So. I decided I'd walk away, but this time without regrets. It's my story of true love. Thanks. <laughs>